I'm gonna I'm gonna get going. Um, you know, we've given people just kind of a couple minutes to arrive. Uh, hey everyone, I am Molly. I'm the developer relations manager at Elemental, and uh, gonna kick off uh, the February twelfth, two thousand twenty-two Dagster community meeting. So um, here's the agenda today. We're gonna start out with a few announcements. Um, I have a particular hiring announcement I wanna discuss. Um, show off the new community page. Uh, Yuhan's gonna talk about GitHub discussions and um, Sandy will give a bit of an update uh, on what's going on as we're working towards um, 015. And then uh, after that, we'll hear from Daniel on Amy's use of Dagster to tackle biotech data engineering challenges. And then um, from Marcos on how K-12 education leverages analytic engineering using Dagster. And then follow that up with, uh, we'll have some time for questions. So I'll get started with announcements. Um, we're hiring. Uh, here's some of the open um, the availabilities at, at Elemental. Uh, I specifically wanted to call out the developer advocate role um, today because this, uh, um, the reason being is that this, for this particular role, it'd be extra amazing if we could get somebody who's in the community, who's already excited uh, about Dagster and wants to join us to um, help others have an amazing experience with Dagster as well. So the role includes engaging with users, creating educational content around Dagster, representing Dagster in the developer community, attending conferences and uh, community events, etc. Um, so yeah, if you already enjoy using it and you want to help others have an, a great, amazing experience with it, we'd love to have you apply. Uh, the link for roles is on the slide. And I also wanted to quickly show off the new community page. So I'm actually going to just open that up quick. Um, yeah, so thanks to... Uh, Josh, our designer, we have a new community page and um, it shows off uh, some of the upcoming events. I even, there's a event happening in Vienna that highlights Dagster, I added that as well. Um, we want this to not just be a place where we can put elemental like events that we're putting on, but if there's events going on in the community that are related to Dagster, um, that we can include them here as well. Um, Additionally, uh, links out to some GitHub discussions with you, which Yuhan will talk about in a bit. And then there's also this community spotlight section where we're trying to highlight um, contributions that are coming straight from the community. So, for example, even in just this past month, we've had there's been several um, blog posts uh, that have come out from users around Dagster. So um, this is a place where we can highlight those. Uh, Okay. And then, yeah, uh, Yuhan, do you want to chat a bit about GitHub discussions? Um, yeah, um, should I share screen or just let you know that? Uh, uh, either way, I could share it, keep sharing it, if, or okay, you can take yeah. over. If, uh, this if works. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, yeah, this works. Hi, um, I'm Yuhan from the core team. So I'm here to share some recent updates that we've made to our GitHub discussions. Um, we're opening up our discuss GitHub discussions on as a public knowledge base complement to our Slack community. And we figured this will be a great place for folks to explore ideas, discuss best practices or design patterns, and also share what you've made with Daxer um, with um, community members and a core team publicly. Um, here are some quick highlights. Um, can I go next slide? Um, yeah, how to examples. Uh, there is a new design, uh, there's new uh, discussion category called how to examples. Um, this will be a great place to ask questions uh, about how to accomplish a specific use case and find answers with code snippets and examples. With that, we'll also be sure we'll, we will also be um, surfacing frequently asked questions and valuable discussions in Slack to this space for content discoverability. Hope you will find it helpful that questions and answers become more publicly accessible and searchable. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, show and tell. Um, we also opened up a show and tell place. And in there, 
I've recently created a discussion called Companies and DAX Companies um, and Projects Using Daxer, hoping this will become a place uh, for folks to showcase what your companies and projects um, are doing with Daxer, how you're using Daxer, and also gather feedback and thoughts among the community. Um, next, please. Uh, last but not least, as mentioned, as Molly mentioned earlier, on um, is higher, and I'm sure our community is too. So, well, we also created this uh, Dax related job openings, which we figure will be a great place for companies to look for people with Dax experience. Um, that's yeah, <clears throat> that's all I have for the discussion uh, updates. And this is something that we are experimenting with. So if you would like to see any changes or have feedback to it, please don't hesitate to pay me directly. Uh, I'm Yuhan in the Slack as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Yuhan. And Sandy, you want to give an update? Yes. Yeah, so super quick update on uh, 0 0.15.0, our next major release. Uh, it's coming up in early June, which is um, about two months from now or a little bit less. Um, <clears throat> uh, Software-defined assets will be fully non-experimental in that release. So right now, they're mostly non-experimental um, in the sense that we don't expect them to, to change in any big ways. Um, but we've been keeping that experimental decorator on there while we um, I are now a few remaining issues. So one of them is uh, interoperability between assets and um, traditional Dexter concepts like ops and graphs. Um, we want to make sure that uh, it's really easy to move fluidly between those between these concepts. So you can uh, take a op and wrap it in an asset, or you can um, say that an asset is produced by a graph of ops instead of just a single op. Um, so uh, we wanted to nail that down. And then we also wanted to nail down asset organization. Um, so it should be easy to uh, wrap a set of assets uh, in a group, um, give those assets a common, uh, a common prefix so they can be uh, referenced in uh, non-namespace conflicting ways um, and show up nicely in Dagit. So <clears throat> there'll be some other announcements of uh, features and improvements that we're working on as well. Uh, but look for a release in early June. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Sandy. Um, so yeah, those are the announcements we have to start with. Um, and so now we're going to hand off to Daniel, um, who will be telling us how Immune uses Daxter. Hi, everyone. Hold on, I'm just going to share my screen. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, my name is Daniel Blinick. Um, I'm a software engineer at Immuni. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to be speaking about how, uh, how we came to Dagster and, and how we make use of it um, as much as possible um, in our pipeline. So just a little bit about me. So I actually started in web development. Um, I joined Immuni about three years ago when it was uh, um, six months old. Uh, and um, I was doing web there for most of my time, actually. And then only about nine months ago, I, I really got into um, data engineering and pipeline. So, um, you know, already from, from my very beginning in this field, I've been with Daxter. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's made the transition uh, a really good one. So um, a little bit about Immuni. Um, we are a, um, a therapeutics company um, that is uh, trying to develop drugs um, that help the immune system fight infection. And in order to do that, we need a very comprehensive understanding of how the immune system works and, and what's really going on there. And there, there are many approaches to take um, in order to achieve that. And the one that we, uh, we've chosen is to do genomic sequencing. And essentially what that does is it, it attempts to measure the activity of genes within cells. So just to make that a little bit more concrete, most people have heard of DNA sequencing. You know, you, you take a, a saliva sample, you send it to a lab, 
and you you understand more about your DNA. Um, but in, in, in every cell in your body, the DNA is essentially the same. And what differentiates cells from each other is which part of that blueprint uh, is used in the different cells. And so when we can delve into that, we get a picture of what's going on in your immune system. And, and, and uh, that's really what we're trying to do. So the challenge for me as an engineer and, and our engineering team is essentially converting that biological data that we get from our lab um, into digital data and then transforming it, enriching it um, in order for our computational biologists and our, our data analysts um, downstream of the pipeline uh, to do analysis, um, AI, machine learning, um, and, and bring insight into uh, how we can better develop drugs. So just to, uh, again, make this a little bit more concrete, uh, I, I, I wanted to present one of the main data structures we work with, which is um, the, C the cell gene matrix. Um, and, and as I was trying to explain before, this, this matrix is essentially <clears throat> made up of columns, which are our cells, and then the, the rows are genes. And the values are, are how, uh, how prevalent that gene is expressed within the cell. And so different uh, types of cells will have different gene signatures. And by doing that, we can understand what's going on in the immune system. For example, one patient might have a higher prevalence of T cells as, as opposed to B cells. Uh, and that tells us something. That tells us when, when we know that that patient responded to a treatment, we know that that, you know, that that alignment of signatures might be playing a role. And these matrices get really, really you know, big in size. Um, um, you know, they get to about 5 billion da uh, data points when we're talking about across a project. And that's one of the, the challenges that we deal with, um, scaling that so, so an analysts can work with those data sets in a, a, a very efficient manner. And so just to give a, an overview of, of what our pipeline looks like, um, essentially the steps themselves, the business logic are, is written by computational biologists. Um, and us on the, the data engineering team, we're um, really um, responsible just for the orchestration logic um, of what gets run when. Um, and we try not to concern ourselves with um, the actual business logic itself. So uh, initially, uh, when the company was about uh, a year old, we developed a, a homegrown solution. Um, and what that gave us was a lot of flexibility. It was written in Python. Um, and the people who wrote it um, did a great job. Uh, again, we, we weren't, it, the company was so new that we just didn't really know exactly where we wanted the flexibility. And so the solution did give us a lot of that. And um, and it worked. It was it was it was written. It worked, and and it served us well for a, for a while. But um, as time went on, we we started to have issues with it, and and just natural as as a company grows. Um, and so the, the three main uh, things that that really kept uh, coming up were one is that there was no we didn't have a dev environment. Um, you know, creating that kind of environment obviously takes a lot of resources and we just didn't have that. And because the computational biologists uh, were the ones changing the business logic, they had no dev environment, they couldn't test things really until it hit production. And, and so the development cycle was very brittle. Um, we also didn't have a UI. We had something very hacked together, but it, it wasn't uh, very uh, usable. Um, and um, the flexibility that served us well in the beginning as the uh, orchestration logic got more and more complex. Um, it just got very unwieldy, and um, we ended up in a situation where there was a there wasn't a lot of transparency. One person really, only one person really knew what was going on within the code, um, and it just became very unworkable as the company grew. So we so this is essentially what uh, it looks like now. Um, and uh, when we started exploring. Um, you know, I was tasked with doing a little bit of research into uh, the different frameworks, and we kind of boiled it down to, you know, the main player, Airflow, uh, which is, you know, that's what everyone's heard of, even if you're not a data engineer. Uh, and uh, I actually didn't find Daxter. Uh, one of my one of my colleagues did, uh, and so we really boiled it down to these two. 
Um, are we going to go with like the name uh, that everyone knows? Um, or are we going to uh, take a risk on a smaller project, which, um, you know, definitely felt like it suited us better. Um, and we ended up obviously going with Daxter um, for the for for these five reasons, which uh, I'll, I'll delve a little bit into. So uh, firstly, um, the abstractions in Daxter just seemed to be very well thought through. Um, we, when we were doing the analysis, it was just around the time when uh, Dexter switched from um, pipelines and solids and composite solids to graphs and ops. And just uh, even just that, you know, um, switching to the graphs, which are um, kind of, you can have as many graphs within graphs and there's no difference between uh, a subgraph and a graph, just uh, the, the, the thought behind that uh, really appealed to us. The other thing we really liked um, was the data centric pipeline model, seeing the pipeline as a flow of data um, really just made a lot of sense to us and it's much more intuitive um, than the airflow model. And what I've taken the screenshot here of here is um, the, the being able to run from a point in the graph, which really revolves around the fact that it's that the pipeline is centered around around data. Um, and we've used that uh, countless times. So it's really uh, served us well. Um, this feature also, this is something that's, uh, uh, our pipeline makes use of this dynamic mapping feature, which not all pipelines have, uh, um, orchestration platforms have, um, which is the ability to kind of define the graph at runtime based on you know, certain metadata. So uh, yeah, this may simplified how many different jobs we needed to, to use. Um, and again, like we really, really like this feature. Um, the asset materializations, um, we, uh, truthfully, we haven't actually utilized this as much as uh, we should. And we're really excited about the new developments uh, uh, in the asset space. Um, but, but really even just the, the idea of kind of like uh, um, uh, declaring the assets that have been created and being able to track it and link it back to the run very, very easily uh, makes debugging, de uh, debugging things easier. And, and um, again, just like that thought behind it was really attracted us as well. Um, I also, I don't, I didn't even add this here, but um, <laughs> I guess this is kind of a, a meta point for all the slides that came before it, but Daggett was just in our mind so much better than, uh, than the Airflow UI and a lot of the other UIs we saw, it's just very simple. Uh, there's really, there, there aren't that many bells and whistles, which in my mind is a feature. It's very like straightforward. Uh, you don't really have to guess about what you're doing. Um, so that's kind of like what we, the reason we chose it. And, um, but obviously we ended up finding so many more things that uh, really made us happy and continue to make us happy. So I just want to talk a little bit about those uh, and how we use them. Uh, so the first one, uh, which should have been obvious to me, but not being a data engineer, I guess I didn't realize how painful this would have been without resources, but just the ability to use resources to set up different environments, have a test environment uh, very easily, a dev environment very easily, um, and not change the business logic has been amazing. Um, and uh, it's, it really just takes away so much of the magic um, in, in the sense that you, you know exactly what you're doing in a test environment. You don't have to rely on frameworks that are filling in all these gaps for you. You're, you're feeding it the resources yourself. Um, and yeah, it just made things so much easier to work with. Uh, custom IO managers, um, we've also uh, made use of. Um, this is one of our, our IO managers uh, that basically just uh, um, uh, extends the in-memory uh, IO manager, but in addition, it just dumps the content into a bucket. Um, and we have a few others like this. And uh, again, just added flexibility is great. Uh, the different sensors we've made use of, um, <clears throat> we uh, make use of the failure success sensors, obviously the standard sensors to kick off jobs. Um, and we, at one point, we're making use of an asset materialization sensor. Um, and yeah, it's just 
a wealth of um, things to choose from to do what you want just makes everything uh, the code a lot simpler and, and uh, more obvious in terms of what you're trying to do. Um, the GraphQL uh, API is something new that we've just been exploring. Uh, we're using it to um, what we call like nuking our jobs that went wrong. Um, sometimes we have jobs that run with, with the wrong metadata. Um, and so uh, we use it to kind of query the runs. This is still in development and then just get rid of them. And then the sensor kicks off, <clears throat> kicks them off again with the updated metadata. Um, and actually as an added bonus, we, uh, this has been my introduction to GraphQL and, and, uh, you know, I've just come to use it in all sorts of other places as a, as a bonus. So uh, I just want to share one debate that we had on our team. Um, this was earlier on, uh, um, just to share it with you guys and uh, maybe it'll spark some interesting conversation. Um, so we, uh, we rely, the pipe, our pipeline re relies on, on a bunch of metadata um, and we really weren't sure what to do with that metadata, whether to hold it, uh, hold it in an external database, and query it in during the, during the pipeline run um, or to embed it within the run configuration. Um, and so the pro of putting in the run configuration is that it's explicit. We also take the run configuration and when we create assets, we, we store the run configuration as, as, um, as provenance for that data set. And so anything we put in the run configuration is, is implicitly stored uh, or explicitly stored as provenance, which so storing the metadata in the run config gave us that ability also. Um, more importantly, the metadata can't change mid run. And that's what we were saying we were nervous about. Um, the cons are obviously that um, it makes running from the launch pad almost impossible because you need to then like copy and paste uh, this massive file. It just wouldn't really have been workable. Um, and the provenance that's created on the data set is, is much harder to read because it just gets really big. And so the compromise we came to is we basically created, um, we, we took the files out of the running config, we stored them as um, um, files uh, in Google Cloud Storage that are versioned. Um, and so we just put the version number into the run. Um, and what that guarantees is that it doesn't change mid run. If it does, then it's just a different version of the file. Um, and again, we can, we can run it from the launch pad. It doesn't bloat the, the run configuration. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, it seems like, um, let's see, time. We had a couple questions come in. I think we can ask oh, sure. a couple and then, and then move on to Marcus. Um, Eric Mason asked, was there any experimentation with Airflow previous to implementing Dagster? Uh, yeah, I actually played around with it a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I, I played around. I, I, actually, my colleague was kind of responsible for presenting Daxter. I was responsible for presenting Airflow. Um, and we did it. Um, I may have been a little bit biased by him, but uh, um, but yeah, to me, it was pretty obvious. It, it, in fact, like Airflow, their new version kind of copies a little, like Airflow 2.0 has some like syntax that kind of copies the Daxter uh, syntax of like data movement. And so it was kind of like obvious, like, well, if they're copying them, they probably have the right idea. So. <laughs> and then uh, Nihil Jane asks, um, what is the use case of dynamic mapping? Does it also end up creating dynamic assets? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by dynamic assets. Maybe that's just an area I'm not familiar with. Uh, the, the dynamic mapping is uh, essentially one of the jobs um, it, it only knows, um, so it, it does uh, one step of processing and only then it figures out how many uh, sub steps to create after that. Um, so we could have just created different jobs and, you know, and after the step one, then uh, the sensor could have kicked off the other jobs. Uh, there's actually, we've had this discussion also, um, but, uh, but it's, it, it does, um, it's nice to kind of be able to track it all in one in one flow. So, well, I don't know, Nihil, did that answer your question? 
Yeah, I did. Um, and I think I was just curious to know from business standpoint, like, is it common to have dynamic mapping being used or is it one-off cases? Um, like if you look at all the jobs you have, what portion of them are dynamic versus not? Sure. Um, so we actually don't have that many jobs. Uh, only one of them is, is dynamic. Yeah, the rest are not. Awesome. Um, I also, if I can tack on one more quick question, uh, sure. the run config thing you brought up was absolutely spot on. Like we have had the same discussion here. Um, we are slightly more early stage in the extra use as you guys, um, because a lot of ML config is also like a lot of run configuration, right? And so when you said you were using blob storage to um, store run configs, how does that yeah. work locally? Do people create a run config, send it to GCS, uh, whatever uh, blob storage you're using, and then run Daggett locally? And you point to that, or yeah, locally. Um, so right now, locally, uh, we just we have a separate bucket for staging, uh, and we'll, and we'll just use that bucket lo like on dev as well. Um, like the the main <clears throat> sorry the main difference between our dev and our our production is one just writes into production and one doesn't, we don't really have a separate data store to pull from, pull data in for local runs right now. I see, okay. So you still use blob storage for uh, running locally. Uh, that's the way to yeah. change configs for developers. Okay, cool. Right. Any last questions for Daniel? All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Now, um, on to Marcos. Hello, Dexter friends. Let's share this for you. And All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that analytics engineers face in K-12 education and how we are leveraging community and open source tooling such as Dagster to solve those challenges. The responsibilities of an analytics engineer more broadly are also true uh, of those in K-12 education. Uh, however, we do have, have our own K-12 specific goals. You know, we do this work because our goal is to provide a complete view of a student. There are many things we want to know about students to ensure that they are on a path to success. We want to know who they are. We want to know their grade level, their race, their ethnicity, if they have a learning disability. And we want to know things like their attendance and things like their, their grades. And so let's look at the challenge that, that we face with data in K-12. So our disparate data is spread across many different systems, and that may sound super familiar and similar to, to your environment. Student data, attendance, grades, assessment, et cetera, it's housed in various systems. Uh, and unfortunately, Fivetran and Stitch just don't have connectors for us. Assuming that the vendor has a method for us to get data out from their system, that method is going to vary from vendor to vendor. So hopefully they have an API, that, that's uh, wonderful. Uh, but sometimes they have just SFTP drops. Sometimes they can email us a file on a schedule. Uh, sometimes we have to log into their system and we have to download an extract of our student data uh, or sometimes we don't get anything um, and, and we have to engage in, uh, in conversations with that vendor to, to see what's, what's possible in terms of putting, what can be put on their roadmap. Now, once we get the data out, well, similar data can be represented very differently. So on the left column, we have the student last name. We can call that student last name, but other vendors may call that last name. Some may call it family name and, and others last surname. And so that's just a look at kind of how, how different, how disparate the data can be 
uh, in terms of location, access, and what it actually looks like. And end of the day, people, our, our customers who are our educators, our school leaders, our students, our families, they just want the insight, right? And so they just want to know uh, for the specific education organization. So think school district, think state, think charter management organization. They just want to know what is their student nutrition? How many students have left since the start of the school year? How many students are chronically absent and, and who are they? Which students have a learning disability or, or an IEP is, is what we call it. And when you look at data, how can you cut that data by the different things? Look at things like attendance um, by race and ethnicity or, or by gender, et cetera, et cetera. And so let's look at how, how we're solving that in K-12. So uh, the solution is being built through a community led by the EdFi Alliance. It's a 501c3 nonprofit and the EdFi Alliance has committed to publishing all technology open source under an Apache license. The community works on a set of rules for collecting and organizing student data, and those rules manifest themselves in the EdFi data standard. The EdFi data standard is a set of RESTful APIs. And so the screenshot on the right may look familiar to you. This is just a swagger document, uh, but the power is, is that all of the endpoints have been decided by the community, and then we can go to the vendors and, and we can say, this is how we collect student data. We use these endpoints, the endpoints have these payloads, and it uses this nomenclature. And so it just sets, uh, sets the tone for the conversation. So we are all talking uh, similarly, and, and our conversations themselves can be interoperable. So, Let's look at this diagram. So here is where the collection of disparate operational data gets really cool. Through either state mandates, philanthropic funding, or just good intentions, the vendors create an EdFi API client that takes their operational data and sends it back to customers via the customer's EdFi API. Said another way, it is the responsibility of the vendor to submit data back to the education organization. The education organization does not pull data from the source systems. They stand up their own EdFi API that's following that data standard, and then they receive the data back to them. And we have had a lot of success with states creating mandates. So for example, if you do business in the state of Texas, in the state of Arizona, Wisconsin, uh, you can only do business in the state if you maintain an EdFi integration. So EdFi eases the process for education organizations to receive their operational data via a common data standard and model. This solves the operational piece, but does not touch on analytics. And that is where Dagster comes in. Once an education organization has their disparate operational data in a common operational data store or ODS, Dagster is used to pull that data back out of the EdFi API, store it in a data lake, and materialize it in BigQuery in nice, tidy data marks. Here's what that looks like, just a level deeper. And so in this example, uh, I am using Google Cloud Storage uh, for my data lake, and I am querying that data lake via BigQuery through what are called external tables. Uh, and I'm using dbt, uh, which, which we all know, uh, to manage my SQL transformation work. So let's look at just a few kind of screens uh, so I can walk you through and this and help you be able to put your finger on it. So here's that Swagger document uh, I shared. And so the Dagster graph today uh, looks a little something like this. So it's your kind of traditional uh, ELT job where you've got this central extract and load, um, but I've got to run some ops at the top because the EdFi API has this idea of change versions. And what that allows me to do is pull deltas. So I can pull all, all data for an education organization on the first run, and then on subsequent runs, I can just pull what has been changed or, or deleted. So I run those ops first, 
and then I move into the extract and load. And this is all one, one single op, op today because I'm using, as I'm fetching from the API, I'm using a generator to be able to yield results back and upload to the data lake to reduce the memory footprint. But it's definitely like a to-do on my, my side um, to be able to split that out if I can, and we'll likely reach out to all of you on Slack uh, for some thought partnership uh, at some point. And then the final op there is running the EdFi models. Now, something that Sandy said earlier uh, in, in this meeting really caught my ear around being able to mix assets and ops. That's going to be um, super powerful because in this example, I'm running a, a bunch of ops to be able to produce an initial asset to then produce additional assets via DBT tooling. Uh, and that's where, if you haven't checked out software defined assets, I really recommend it because this graph is hiding the DBT models or, or those assets. And this is what software defined assets allows you to do is it allows you to blow up your, your DBT um, files to be able to visualize that uh, inside of Dagster. And so I have things such as this facts table down here and I can see the things, the dependencies um, and the things that have to be run upstream to be able to get there. And I can start to see, well, what are, what are being, what's being done in Python, what's being done um, in DBT. So I just wanted to, to show that visual. This is what that data lake looks like. So I'm using Hive partitioning inside of Google Cloud Storage to be able to have my various API resources, and then to be able to have my data uh, segmented by school year. And if you have used Hive partitioning, you, you know this, this equal sign. And to be able to run Dagster jobs where they always just extract and load into the data lake. Nothing gets deleted, everything gets preserved, um, and everything gets put there as just raw JSON. And then in BigQuery, I'm able to have these tables where they are external tables. So if I look under details, it's an external table. It's pointing to my, uh, to my sandbox environment that is my, my bucket that has my raw uh, JSON and is using Hive partitioning. And so I can build DBT models uh, that are using SQL um, to, to query this external table, which is really just my portal into my data lake um, so I can get into, so I can create my various data marts. So things like grades, fact table, uh, my, my dims and, and what have you. Um, so that's just a little look at that piece. And then a few other things that I, I wanted to mention. So this work can get pretty com complex. Uh, and so let's talk about uh, community to see how it's, it's taking place. So as an, as a K-12 analytics engineer, I maintain open source repositories that implement everything that you've seen here. You can access it at k12analyticsengineering.dev. I also maintain a Google sheet that lays out the learning journey for a person to become an analytics engineer in the K-12 space. Uh, finally, I also provide pro bono mentorship and support to any education organization that wants to tackle this work to help their, their students. Uh, and then um, the resources will be also turning into a publicly accessible free online bootcamp that will run in cohorts where people can consume it. Um, and they, they will walk through a full implementation, learn how to do it, do it themselves, have the community for support. Um, again, all, all free, publicly accessible. Um, one more thing before we, we move into questions. So there are times when a vendor does not build an EdFi API client to send data back to an education organization. There we, le we leverage Dagster as well. For example, I maintain an open source repo that extracts data from the Google Forms API and submits that data to the EdFi API via their surveys endpoint. And so that's another part is when, you, when the work just gets even more complex, is looking to the community to solve things together um, and to share those, those resources so that we can all, all benefit because uh, we all have the same goal 
which is you know, bring that data together to provide insights back to our educators so that they know how to, where and how to, to help students. That's a look at K-12. Uh, I will turn to any questions that people have. Any questions for Marcus? What cadence do you end up uh, updating your assets? Yeah, right now there are batch uh, ETL runs that are happening every night. And so as analysts, we say that our data products are up to date as of the last uh, school day. Um, and so teachers take attendance, they grade things, we let that settle. And so we're reporting things as of, as of the previous day. Got it. While people think of other questions, I'm also just gonna let you know, I have a community, meet back, community meeting feedback form. I'm gonna toss it in the chat. Um, so if you wanna check that out and add if you have any feedback, that'd be great. Uh, but yeah, any, any, what other questions do people have for Marcos? Hi, Marcos. It, um, maybe one question for me. Like, I, could you uh, explain in, in more detail how you leverage the, the software asset? Uh, I think that's something I haven't used so far much. So uh, I don't think I fully understood exactly what you do. So you, you run the EDFI models, and every time you materialize all, all these assets, is that correct? Yeah, I'll do my best. It's certainly new, uh, new to me on, on my side. So historically, we we've created these graphs uh, that are linking together various ops and the dependencies between the ops all happen when you, when you go to create the graph. And, and toward the end of that graph, uh, I would have some code that would explicitly materialize the, the asset. So let Dexter know like, hey, this whole graph was, was to create this, this asset. And, and one, one thing that I've loved about Dagster over other orchestration tools is that uh, it's it's opinionated, uh, and so as the Dagster team has been publishing writings around software defined assets, that started to help um, form my thinking around well, all of all of my jobs are these these graphs that always produce an asset, and so it's it's shifting the the way you think about this stuff to. Well, instead of, of starting with that op part, I'm going to start with the asset part. And I'm going to start to define kind of what is the asset and what upstream assets is it, is it responsible for. Um, and so the, I've been moving into software defined assets because it lets me not talk to other analytics engineers about the jobs we are running, but instead talking about the assets that we are materializing and then creating schedules to rematerialize those and understand which ones go stale. So what I'll say is it is it's helpful to shift your thinking and then like actual like rubber meets the road. The thing you also see is that it gains the ability um, to do things like include other products graphs within your Dagster UI. So taking that graph from, from DBT and including it uh, appending it, if you will, to your, your existing Dexter one and giving you one pane um, to be able to see that, which, which is just awesome. So I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. I think I need to do more of it myself, but that, that was very helpful. Thank you. There's also a question that was posted in the chat um, from Asaf Lavi. Uh, do you use Dexter to monitor data quality? Great, great question. Yes. Um, yeah. So we, we have two things. The first one is, uh, we get some referential integrity in the EdFi API. So if, if you go and you try to load some attendance for a student who's not actually a student, the API rejects it. So at the collection of the operational level, um, we get a ton of validation there. But the, the other thing that I have is in the DBT 
uh, in the DBT code, there are, are over a hundred tests um, that are also looking for things. And so is the, is the student's grade mark one of the known letter grades, right? You can get an, you can get an A in a course, uh, but you cannot get uh, an M in a course. Uh, and so using DBT to look, to, to look for that and to also, as I'm creating my dimension and fact tables, if I'm creating a, a foreign key in a fact table, then there's a DBT test that is documenting that uh, so that it can check, well, is, is that key, does it actually exist in the DIM um, that, that it, should, it should be in? And so when it runs through, it runs through all, all of those tests as well um, to ensure that, that uh, we have good, good data. Yeah, great question. Yeah, and then he actually followed up with, given that your source data are partitioned, how do you manage incremental updates to your debt models? Can you backfill for particular partitions to fix bugs, for instance? Yeah, uh, I haven't gotten there yet. And so right now, when I, when I run the job, um, I'm essentially querying the entirety of the data lake again to rebuild these, the DBT models versus like an incremental um, approach. That, that's definitely on my mind as well uh, as the, the project looks to, to scale. Um, most of the school districts that this is used in are uh, under 2000 students. Uh, but as it as it starts to be looked at by by larger districts, um, it will have to be a little bit um, smarter with the with that that layer. Um, yeah, great question. Um, haven't gotten there yet. Any other questions for Marcos? Or if people have questions for um, the folks who work on Daxter. going to give it another few seconds. <laughs> okay. okay. Seems like that might be it. Um, thank you so much, Marcos and Daniel, uh, for those demos. They were fantastic. Um, calling out once more that uh, I'll post this. Um, feedback form in the chat. Um, and one more shout out about the fact that we're hiring developer advocates. Uh, <laughs> if anyone's interested, feel free to ping me. Um, and I think with I think with that, meeting adjourned. Uh, thanks for everyone for joining. Thank you.